who speaks up for the caregiver? Who cares for the caregiver? Right. So that's what, that was the need that I saw in the hospital, um, sitting in rehab, um, sitting, sitting just listening, being quiet, observing the, the faces, the minds, and, and the life of the caregiver, of the person being, you know, that, that was chosen, whether they were chosen by default, whether they were chosen by design, or whether they were chosen just because they were the only person that answered the phone. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Allie, and I'm Living Chronic Faith. Thanks for stopping by, and welcome to the podcast. The name says it all. I believe that our faith has to be as chronic as our symptoms, and this podcast is a safe space for us to explore meaningful ways to live our lives according to that faith. It's my prayer that after this episode, you will be more encouraged, more educated, and more equipped to live out your chronic faith. Hello, and welcome to the Living Chronic Faith Podcast. I'm Allison, and I am excited to introduce our guest for today, the incomparable Tiffany Myers. We are talking about caregiving today, and she has an amazing testimony and caregiving journey that she's going to share. So I am not going to take up time with an introduction. She needs no introduction. I would love to hear from you, Tiffany. So first of all, welcome. Thank you for being with Thank me. you. Thank you. Um, tell us just a little bit about your caregiver journey. How did you step into that role and what was that process like? And how did that lead to the start of your ministry? Oh, wow. So how did I step into caregiving? So my husband had a lung transplant. That's the short of the short of it. But before his transplant, he had been dealing with he. He has, he had sarcoidosis and I say had in the past tense, even though doctors have said, oh, well, he still has it. Well, we don't see any traces of it. So he had sarcoidosis. He had had that for over 15 years. Um, and progressively, you know, sarcoidosis, it, it flares up and then it goes into a remissive state. Well, he'd had that happen several years over time. And then what he developed was a condition or a, um, a virus, so to speak, that's called NTM. NTM is MAC. It's known as Mycobacteria avium complex. And basically it is like the flu and pneumonia on steroids in your body. It comes from a bacteria that is in the water, that is in dirt, that we all have. But whenever you have an immunocompromised system, it wreaks havoc in your system because his lungs were where he, his sarcoidosis resided. It wreaked havoc on on his lungs. He had it once. They treat it for, they treat it for as long as you have it. And after the um, bacteria no longer shows in your sputum or a bronchoscopy, which they do like the tube and they do a biopsy of your lungs, they still treat it for um, more than likely for six to 18 months after that, because they said that it could lay dormant in your system. So he had it, it started in 20, 18, late 2018, early 2019. He had it, he got over it. They did a round of antibiotics, strong rounds, like so strong until one of the um, antibiotics that he was on, it had to be inhaled. It was like an um, inhaler and a nebulizer, but it had its own inhaler. It had its own nebulizer. You had to take it seven days a week, twice per day. And it was just approved by the FDA. They said, normally they find Mac in little old white ladies. That's what they told us. He was a, a younger black male. So it was not something that they normally saw. Um, and his was very aggressive the way it started because it started like he had a cold. It was like the sarcoidosis mm -hmm. started acting up again. And they kept giving him rounds of antibodies. Every time he came off the antibodies within less than a month, he was back in the same space. So doctors said they wanted to test. They found out what it was. It's a special team they treat. So he had Mac twice when it came back the second time and one of the doses or one of the drugs that is an antibiotic is about this big it's about that big we didn't know how we were going to pay for it it was ten thousand dollars per vial he had to take that twice a day we didn't pay one dime and tell you how god works so anyway that was the beginning of the um sarcoidosis and ntm journey so i was taking care of him part-time because 
right around that time, before that time, that was whenever COVID started, you know, COVID started back then as well. It looked like COVID, even whenever COVID was going on, there were some things that they were running out of that he needed. They took him out of work. I was taking care of him, but it was part time, you know, it wasn't big. I was home. It was fine. So after that, and then after he got better, they told him, okay, well, you might need some lungs five to 10 years from now. That was in 2021. 2021, 2022. Less than a year later, they mm -hmm. came back because his NTM came back. He started getting sick again. The bacteria came back. He started getting sick again. And they were like, oh, we need to do a lung transplant. You need to do evaluation. We started that in 2022, September. He had to do evaluation. That was less than a year later. When they said five to 10 years. Mm. So really I started taking care of him then, like really caretaking. Before I was doing it, but it didn't feel like it. Even though I was in the throes of it, it didn't feel like it. So at that time, September, then October, I lost my job. Um, so I was really taking care of him full time, but in December, he started getting sicker and sicker and sicker. So we had to go from, we live in South Carolina, we had to go from Columbia, South Carolina weekly to Charleston because they say, you're really getting bad. We need to see you all the time. We started going there weekly. We'd leave on a Sunday or Monday. We wouldn't come home until Thursday or Friday, depending on testing. And he had to be there for physical therapy. So of course I was a driver. I was doing everything pretty much. And then after he got sick, he got sick again. He got sick in December. He had to go in the hospital. He got sick again in February, no, January. And when he got sick in January, February time frame, he got sick to the point where he was sick over the weekend. And I was calling, like I was calling the doctors. I was like, y'all got to do something. By that Monday, about 8.30, they were calling me. You know, that's unheard of for a doctor's office right. or for, they were calling me. And they were like, okay, what we're going to do, we're going to get a room ready. We're going to have to have you all come down here. At that point, that day, he was like, I just can't get up out of bed. He couldn't get himself dressed. So sarcoidosis affects your lungs. He had gone on, he was on like four liters of air with the NTM, um, the second round. And he was only using it for like sleep and things of that nature. Well, he went from about four liters, maybe sleeping with until around about that time, whenever it started getting bad, he was on um, eight liters whenever he was moving around. Yeah. yeah. So he was like, I just can't get dressed. I can't get up. So it was literally, I'm having to do everything. So that means that whenever we went to trips to Charleston, I had to pack the car, I had to pack the bags, I had to do all these things. So that's where my caregiving journey really, really started. And then it was, okay, having to care for him up to the point of um, transplant. Mm -hmm. Now, his transplant journey was amazing because even at that point, you know, knowing that he needed a transplant you're pl praying for it right but but i knew that there was healing i didn't know what it looked like and i kept hearing god say suddenly mm -hmm. i thought that he was going to have a sudden healing but even if you look from september to march whenever he had his transplant somebody might say oh that's sudden but when you can't breathe that's you can't true. tell a person that can't breathe what is sudden Mm -hmm. because that's a long time not able to breathe and it was if he would get up like if I were to get up right now and I were to sit back down he would be out of breath that's mm -hmm. how bad it was so even though it looks like a short time it wasn't a short time but the sudden wasn't his preliminary it was the post because he got the phone call he got put on the list on the 24th of February the day after his birthday he said it was the best birthday present he ever got 16 days later, they called him and said, we've got lungs. Wow. 15 days after he got the call to get lungs, had the surgery, he was getting out of the hospital. Okay. Walking around looking nothing like he had had any type surgery, not using any type, kind of oxygen. He didn't, he looked nothing like what he went through at all. 
So that's what began my caregiving journey. And what began the caregiving ministry was while he was in the hospital. Before that, so I'm a minister already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am I am referred to, and I use this, I am who God says I am. Amen. So I am called a prophetess. I just speak and say what God gives me to. Mm -hmm. um, but I had already been in ministry while walking with him, caregiving for him. There is always someone else who needs something that God has for you to give to them. That didn't stop my walk, even while doing everything with him, even while he was going through everything that he was going through. That didn't stop the phone calls in ministry. That didn't stop the phone calls of, hey, I need you to pray for me. That didn't stop any of that. And it even expanded in the hospital because even while he was in recovery, while he was in ICU recovering, I was out praying in the ICU waiting area with other families. Before he even got that, the, there's a funny story about how he, <laughs> so we're supposed, the caregiver is supposed to be there. And I really wasn't leaving him home by himself. However, my son needed to go to the airport the morning that he got the phone call. Mm. Three of us were thinking, what if they call today? Guess what happened? None of us said it to each other, but they called that very morning. My son had to be at the airport by five. 5.30, something like that. They called at five o'clock in the morning. I was not home. There was no way that, I, and my son had to go to Charleston. It was so funny. Wow. A girlfriend of mine actually came to my house and took him. My nephew was here, but I'm like, I need somebody with the presence of mind to be moving like this. Cause my husband wasn't moving fast, mm -hmm. but my nephew helped him get ready. It was funny. It is a comedy show in how they sit. Cause my nephew was like, well, he sat on the bed. I sat on the bed. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Cause my girlfriend was like, where is he? Why is he not downstairs? <laughs> but that's just how God will orchestrate things. Mm -hmm. But the, the best part about it was God knew where we needed to be because before they even got down to the hospital, I walked the floor of that hospital praying. Yeah. beforehand and they, they tell you that it could be a dry run they could call you for mm -hmm. a, a an organ they can call you and say that they have it but it doesn't mean that they're going to give it to you it could be a dry run meaning the organ that they have still doesn't meet the criteria even after they've inspected it one to two to three times before they even see you they've matched it mm -hmm. and everything but they could even have you on the table about to do the surgery and they're like no it's a no-go we're not going to do this surgery today so there was still that possibility whenever we got down there we, he got down there and they said be at the hospital by eight o'clock he got the phone call at five he called me he was like i'm gonna get to the hospital mm -hmm. <laughs> my youngest son had just gotten off work three or four or five o'clock in the morning i knew he wasn't coming because he had worked too hard i was like that that's a dangerous thing right there mm -hmm. my nephew was like i was like and then i had my keys i had both fobs who does that <laughs> so i called my girlfriend and i'm like god who am i going to call that has the presence of mind that is up this time of morning my girlfriend was supposed to preach mm -hmm. at my church she was up five o'clock in the morning. You know what she said to me? What well, we got? We got lungs. Where are we going? We get, we ready to go. That's what that was her response. Ready, ready, ready. God dropped her name. She didn't answer the first time. I'm like, God, what are we doing? What are we gonna do? Because she's not answering the phone. You told me to just. You just told me to call her. Mm -hmm. And then I Facetimed her, and she picked up the phone. She was at my house so fast. My nephew was like, she has to live next door. When he saw where she lived, he said, it's no way in the world she got there <laughs> to the wow. house this fast. But she did. She got to the house. She came. She got him. They came to the house. And even before, because they started getting him ready, like eight o'clock, we were there and they started, they were like, okay, you know, take your stuff. I'll put a gown on. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's regular. Didn't feel regular though. And then 30, 45 minutes was going by and they were like, well, okay, well, we're going to start prepping you and this, that, and the third. So we're looking at one another. We were like, mm. he was like, well, don't call anybody. I'm like, I'm not calling anybody because we don't want it to be a dry run. Then we don't want to get you partially excited or whatever. And, you know, 
So a few minutes later, and we were like, well, okay, well, well what y'all doing? And they were like, well, we're going to start the IV. So, you know, you starting some IVs. They started IV. They were like, oh, no, we're doing this surgery. We're going to take them back about 12, 1230. Mm. That's less than three hours. After you all said, I'm like, oh, yeah, these are your lungs. These are yours. This is yours. This is right here. And when we realized that we were, we were sitting around me, him, my girlfriend, and my nephew. My nephew came to we bought everybody except dog. <laughs> but it was so funny because my girlfriend was there and the doctor came in and he was like, who is this? I was like, this is my sister. <laughs> right. My nephew, this is my sister. Don't worry about why so many people here this early in the morning. We have an entourage. And we travel that way. <laughs> so, you know, he was like, okay. Once they came in, the anesthesiologist came in, they explained everything, you know, they signed papers and everything. We went into straight prayer. Literally, we went, Holy Spirit fell in that room, mm -hmm. fell in the room, just fell in the room. And what you can't do is, is shield the Holy Spirit or keep the Holy Spirit to yourself. Mm -hmm. We walk the floor. We walk that in. Because I can't have a miracle and not expect God to do a miracle for somebody else. That's right. So that was how I started ministry in caregiving. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. So what was it that you saw or experienced that helped you understand the need for caregiving ministry? Mm, the lack mm. is what I saw. So the lack thereof, um, and the reason I saw and said that there was a lack of is because from a caregiver's perspective with transplant, let's just talk about transplant. I'm going to go real small and then I'm going to branch out. So from a caregiver perspective with transplant, they focus on the transplantee. They give things to the transplant um, caregiver, mm -hmm. but, and I'm not saying that they should focus, but there should be a great balance. Because the caregiver not only gives up so much, you feel like you're alone a lot of the times. You're mm. giving and you're giving and you're giving, but who checks on you? So there was a lack of, you know, from a transplant plant's perspective, we have to fundraise if you don't have the money because you're not going to get put on a transplant list if you don't have a certain amount of money allocated. So how do you care for the person that you're caring for work, care for children, be the caregiver, be that primary source. A lot of times the person who from a lung transplant perspective or from a major organ perspective, they're not necessarily thinking clearly because if you can't breathe, you don't think straight. Right. Sometimes you can't read. Sometimes you're not retaining the information. So you're having to raise money. You have to keep it um, a track of doctor's appointments, medications, appointments, um, things of that nature. And then you're having to make sure that you have everything in order um, from a transplant perspective. So it was a lack thereof. And then just seeing the people that were in the hospital, there was this one lady one day, she had so many calling, so many people calling her and her has, husband had cancer. He had myeloma. So it was, it was, it was malignant. It's mm -hmm. not like he was coming out of this. And she had people just calling her and calling her and calling her. And I said, sit down and take a minute to breathe. Sit down and take a minute for yourself. There are so many caregivers that were in the hospital that were in that predicament. People are constantly calling on the person that pours, but who do they call on? Who helps them? Who tells them to sit down? Who tells them to rest? Who tells them to know you go be by yourself? Take a minute. Don't think about any of this stuff. Don't even think about you have bills at home. You have work. You have people calling you. Then you have people that are checking and saying, hey, what's going on? And what you want to do, you want to give them an update. You want to give them an accurate report, but you don't want to give them too much because sometimes you just don't feel like answering questions. So the thing about it is it was a lack thereof. There was a huge need. There were people that were suffering in silence. There was this one woman who was caregiving for her husband. Her husband had been sick. He had had a transplant. He needed more care. He was depressed. He was anxious. And his, his lung transplant hadn't gone like they may have thought. And he was on the, on the 
verge of, oh, you might have to have another lung transplant. We just did one. So he couldn't breathe, but she wasn't breathing. Mm. I held the woman's hands and it took five minutes for her to take a deep breath, deep enough for her to really exhale and understand that she needed to let go. Yeah. Not let go of the responsibility, but let go of the things that weren't serving her well. Let go of the let go of the worry, the shock, and the things that weren't pouring into her. Wasn't meeting her need, the things that weren't allowing her to even think clearly the things that weren't even allowing her to breathe freely. And she was so, she was so tight until she realized that it was Good Friday when she held my hand and she said, it's Holy Week and it's Good Friday. She said, you're an angel. I said, no, I'm not. I said, I'm just the, the servant of God that was sent so that you could breathe. That's all I am. That's all I am. And a lot of times caregivers need a reminder that one, you're not alone. Two, you need support. Three, it's okay to ask for it. Four, sometimes you just have to be. Yes. And not be the caregiver, but just be. Just be. And sometimes just being means you can be angry. You can be mad. You can be frustrated. You can be who you are for yourself without negating your feelings, your love and the care for the person that you are there for, caring for. Mm -hmm. So it was a lack. There was a need. There was a huge need. There were caregivers that were that were looking like the, the world was lost to them. Mm -hmm. They didn't have support. Who speaks up for the caregiver? Who cares for the caregiver? Right. So that's what that was the need that I saw in the hospital, um, sitting in rehab, um, sitting, sitting, just listening, being quiet, observing the, the faces, the minds, and, and the life of the caregiver, of the person being, you know, that, that was chosen, whether they were chosen by default whether they were chosen by design or whether they were chosen just because they were the only person that answered the phone. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, there's so much in there that's so powerful. And I just wanted to circle back to one thing. You talked about how it was the lack of that support that mm -hmm. led you to the place where you're now providing that support for others. And I just want to make sure that we don't bypass the truth of that, that sometimes where we see a gap, we are allowed to see that because we're called to fill it. And so let us be mindful not to miss those moments when God is revealing something to us for us to step into purpose. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have done and so beautifully. How do you incorporate self-care into a routine? It was hard. Mm -hmm. Let me just be really, really candid and really, really honest. As a fixer, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as a fixer, caregivers love to fix things. We want to fix our person. We want to fix what's broken. We want to fix everything except ourselves. And what I had to learn was to fix me and to self-care. I needed to fix my lack of care for me. Mm. How did I incorporate it? I had to intentionally do it because putting everyone and everything else ahead of me was doing me a disservice. How can you, let's just be very, very rhetorical. How can you pour from an empty cup? Right. How can you give from an empty space? You cannot. And as much as you want to, you become resentful when you do, you become angry when you do, you feel like you're left out, you feel like you're deprived of so much more Yes. when you don't. So I had to intentionally do it. What did I do? I started by taking five minutes. I take five minutes. I had to learn. I had to take it in small increments. And the reason I had to do that is because there were so many times and I didn't do it until after he got his transplant. Mm -hmm. When I found myself in a depressed place, mm. 
I was giving advice to other people. I was telling them to take time. I was telling them to do all these things and I wasn't doing it myself. And what I had to do was I had to sit down and my sit down got longer than about five minutes. It, it really, it really did. But that was because I became, I was depressed. Mm. Like I felt like there was a whole wait, but I started with five minutes. You can take five minutes. If you put five minutes on a timer, intentionally and take five minutes where you don't think about a doctor's appointment you do not think about the next thing that you have to do you don't think about the next bill that you have to pay you don't think about the next the next appointment that you have to go to you don't think about the phone call that you didn't make you don't think about oh the kids have to go to school i have to drop this person off i have to get up at this time of the morning i have to pack this bag i have to wash these clothes i have to wash the dishes i have to clean the house i have to take the dogs out. you don't think about that you intentionally set your timer for five minutes mm -hmm. five five minutes and you just you can listen to music you can journal, or you can just sit and not think at all. Turn it off, turn it down, but breathe. Because that's one of the things, like I said, he couldn't breathe, but we weren't breathing. Mm -hmm. I was so tight. I didn't know I was tight. It was like my muscles were tense and I didn't know they were tense until I laid down in depression. So intentionally and start out by taking five minutes per day. If you take five minutes per day, do you know how many minutes that is per year? Do you understand that you're not even taking a week in a year for yourself? Mm. That's so good. Take five minutes intentionally. And I think that's the part that mm -hmm. is difficult because caregivers are intentional about everything everything except taking care of themselves and yes. that taking that five minutes I can imagine is probably going to come with a little guilt right of course that guilt of what if something happens when I've stepped away what if they need something what if I miss something that I should have caught you know or what if seeing that I need time away makes them feel bad how do caregivers, how, what advice do you have for them to deal with that guilt? You have to communicate. And the thing about it is the person that you're caring for, they will understand. Matter of fact, they want you to take that time. Mm -hmm. Even if it's somebody that has Alzheimer's and you will say, Tiffany, how do you know about somebody that has Alzheimer's? Both my grandmothers had Alzheimer's slash dementia. And one of the things that they did whenever they were in their quote unquote right mind, baby, you go and do something for yourself. My aunts cared for them. My aunt cared. My aunts cared for my grandmother on my dad's side. She was at home until she passed and she was peaceful. She was a woman who loved God. She was just really peaceful, but she would always be go and do this or go and do that. See, they want you to take time. One, the thing about it is a person who loves you or a person that you're caring for, they want you to be as fulfilled as you can be because they don't want to be a burden. It's not saying that they are, but what it says is they want you to have a little bit of normalcy. They want you to have a little bit of time. They want to see you well. And see, we've gotten so we love to fix things so much and we feel like we're superwoman, superman until we, oh, I can't take, yes, you can. Who told you you could? Mm. Who told you you could not? Mm. Ask yourself that question. Who told you you couldn't take five minutes? Who built that in? Who set that boundary that you couldn't take time? Who told you you couldn't? Who gave you that authority to say that you couldn't? Because even in the Bible, you have to take rest. Amen. If God took rest after he created everything, if the creator, mm -hmm. the creator rested, mm -hmm. who's to say you don't have permission to rest? 
You not only have permission, you have been designed to rest. Mm -hmm. It's your birthright. You're supposed to rest. There are things that you won't see because you will not rest it. Mm -hmm. There are things that you will automatically think of whenever you begin to rest. There are things that will automatically come up and you will do just because you rested. You can think clearly. You can hear clearly. You can see clearly. You can do things better whenever you're coming from a place of rest. Yes. So who told you you couldn't rest? We've built this thing into ourselves. Oh, I can't. I can't. I can't. Who said? Who told you? When did that happen? So let me just be the person to tell you today. Not only should you rest, not only is it your right to rest, who was the liar that told you that you had to go 24-7? Your body was not built to That's stay right. up 24-7. That's right. You were supposed to sleep. It's so many of us that don't sleep because our mind and our body is constantly going. Yeah. You're right. It's time that we take back the things that we should be, the simple things. And see, if we carve out five minutes, if you carve out five minutes per week, that's 35 minutes in one a week. Mm. You mean to tell me you can't even take a half an hour in a week? That's not a lot of time. For yourself. We invest a lot of things, but we won't invest time in ourselves. And that five minutes is invested time in your sanity, in your peace, in your joy. And understand if you don't do it, the person that you love gets the deposits of the negativity. Right, right. You can't be at your best for the person you're caring for mm -mm. if you're not taking care of yourself. That's right. And think about it like this. The person that is caring for someone that doesn't take care of themselves usually finds themselves in a place of being unwell whenever their loved one either recovers or let's just be honest, they die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it also puts that sense of guilt on the person receiving the care. Mm -hmm. Like you said about your grandmothers, they're always saying, take some time for yourself. They understand the strain. They understand the weight of that and they don't want, mm -hmm. uh, and speaking as someone who has lived with chronic diagnoses for years, you don't want someone else to have to carry all of the burden, carry That's right. all the weight. And so most people are motivated to do the part mm -hmm. that they can do. But when they see that person that loves them so much and has given up so much of themselves, mm -hmm. they want that person to have some of their life back. They do. You know, understanding do. I need you, but I also need you to be okay, just like you want me to be okay. That's right. And communicate it. You know, going through what we went through, there was a um there was a workshop, Sarah Jakes came through, mm -hmm. and my girlfriends were like, Tiffany, you gotta come, you gotta come, you gotta come. And I was like, Well, I don't know. They were like, No. And my husband was even like, No, you need to go. Sometimes it is just that communication. And a lot of times people won't say things yeah. that they need. We won't set, we don't like to set realistic boundaries, mm. but then we want to get upset whenever those boundaries aren't met. Say How can again. someone stop? We won't communicate our boundaries, but then we want to get mad about the boundaries when they're not met. That's right. How can somebody know what boundary you have and then you're mad about it if you never told them about it yeah see you sit in a place of resentment that's a place that the enemy will use to get in as a door because mm -hmm. you're resenting what's going on and I'm not saying yeah a lot of times you are mad at the situation you're mad at the illness yep those are valid feelings but why be mad at the person whenever you just need to take a break yeah. only thing you had to do is Baby, I need to take a break. Mom, pa, I need to take a break. Sis, child, 
And that's where it comes to the support system. You communicate, but then do you have a support system that you trust and know that's going to be there? Sometimes it's just going to the store. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine has a chronic illness and she got upset with her husband because she was like, well, he just wants to go somewhere and he doesn't want me to go with him. Why are you mad? Why are you mad? Don't get mad at that man because he's been taking care of you. He has been there for you. He goes to work. He comes home. He takes care of you. And then you get mad because he wants to go somewhere alone. He wants and needs to go somewhere alone just so he can be. Yeah. See, that's the thing. We will get upset. But what are you getting upset at? Are you getting upset because the underlying root cause is this condition, this chronic illness? Or is it the fact that the person that is with you all the time just needs a little bit of air? They need a little bit of space. Mm -hmm. I think that's important too that you talked about building a support network, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and again, that comes with that same communication. Mm -hmm. People will say to you, let me know if there's anything I can do to help. That's right. And you say, I will. And you won't. And you won't. <laughs> you you don't. And, you won't. and then you're sitting there mad, frustrated, angry, mm -hmm. desperate, lonely, upset, depressed, because you just needed a half an hour. Right. But you didn't ask anybody. That's right. And they're not psychic. And they're even if they do see it, they're going to maybe say something to you, depending on the relationship. Mm -hmm. They're not going to insist because mm -hmm. they don't understand necessarily what's happening under the roof. Right. Exactly. But all you have to say is, can you just come and sit on the couch and just listen? Mm -hmm. Just listen, see if they need anything while I step away. That's it. And it's so important to really communicate that. It's important to have people that you know will pray and can get a prayer through. That's right. It's important sometimes to call and say, I could just use a hug. Yes. And people yes. understand that. People understand the stress of caregiving. They under, they mm -hmm. may not be able to relate to it personally. Right. But they understand when you talk to them. Mm -hmm. What is it that keeps us from doing that? Is it pride? Is it something else? What is it? Oh no, it's pride. Mm. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna cut straight <laughs> straight no chase. It's pride. And I'm gonna tell you how I know it's pride because I had that same thing happen to me. And I sat back when my girlfriend said, and I was like, I'm not prideful. Mirror? Mm. Am I prideful? I'm prideful. In the most cunning form of pride. You don't want to seem needy. Yeah. You don't want to seem weak. Mm -hmm. You don't want your strength questioned. You don't want to be questioned about whether or not you have it all together. You don't want to bother people. P-R-I-D-E. With that eye right in the middle. With the eye right in the middle. is serving not even you. That eye doesn't serve you. Mm -mm. Because you're sitting there and you're sitting in a ball of anger. Yeah. And the thing about it is, like you said, these people have reached out. And they have said, what do you need? It doesn't matter if it's a family member. You know what the crazy part about it is? A lot of times it's even the caregiving people that are doctors, nurses. They're even telling you, what do you need? Mm -hmm. How can we support you? See, a lot of times there may be support out there and you don't know what that support is because you've never opened your mouth. A lot of times we have to open our mouths to mm -hmm. find out who can help us, what the help is. And sometimes it's just in conversation, but we sit there like this with our arms crossed, mm -hmm. our legs crossed, and we just don't want to open up. And a lot of times, let me just be clear, a lot of times some of the greatest support team members mm -hmm. might not be your family. Amen. 
Let's just be really honest. Sometimes it's not them. Sometimes they don't know how to support you. Right. But sometimes even in your conversations, talking to the ones that are close to you, you may find that there is somebody else that you can connect to. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's talking to the person that's sitting next to you in rehab or in the hospital or is talking to the social worker, or is talking to the doctor, or is talking to the nurses, or is just being open enough so that these people can understand and they can see. Because God always sends someone. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. He always sends someone. And you have been that someone for so many people and are continuing to serve so many others. And I'm grateful for how you have served even this community. Um, I did want to ask you before we get too far away from it, you mentioned depression. And I feel like mm -hmm. in Christian settings, we don't always talk about depression. Um, and I would like for you to share, because you've shared before mm -hmm. that the depression kind of came after the transplant, mm -hmm. right? Can you right. talk just a little bit about that? Because I think that a lot of caregivers experience this and I just want you to share oh, yeah. about that part of the journey so depression came I I think I was so wrapped up in getting to transplant even if I was depressed it was minuscule um it, it wasn't heavy and I had too much other stuff going on mm -hmm. so it could have been creeping in but I wasn't I, I wasn't at a point where I slowed down enough so, yeah. for it to slow me down so after he had his transplant, after he had had rehab, and this was even after we got home and we got home three and a half months after he had transplant because we had to stay in the area for um, rehabilitation. He had to do that every day. He had to get checkups. He had to continually go to the doctor. So that was an everyday thing. I got home, we were home August, July, August. And I finally slowed down. Like I said, I wasn't working. I was doing ministry, but I wasn't working. I wasn't bringing in a check. <clears throat> One day I went to get up. And it was like a boulder was sitting on top of me. And as that boulder sat on top of me, it was not letting up. It was just like there was weight. It was literal weight on me. And I was in the bed and I was just crying. And my husband was like, what is going on? And I was like, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I can't shake this. I can't, I, I don't know. I can't even articulate mm. what is going on. I can't talk about, I, I don't, I just, I'm, I just, I don't even know if I told him I felt heavy. Like I really literally could not articulate it. <clears throat> and in that I had a, so there were same girlfriend that I called <laughs> that speeded down to Charleston. Mm -hmm. I talked to her and so it was like, four of my girlfriends, some that I really talked to, but it was four main girlfriends that literally, they were like holding up my arms on both sides at any yeah. given time. But one girlfriend said, call depression what it is, it's depression. Mm -hmm. She said, it's not that you're, you know, a lot of times we don't want to say it because we don't want to claim it. She said, no, call it for what it is so that you can get beyond it. Yeah. She said, it's depression. She said, that's what it is. She said, it's depression. Um, another two girlfriends, like they called me, even my sister. My sister was the fifth one. She was like, what do you need? I'm coming to your house. I was like, please don't come to my house right now. I don't want you to go to my house right now. I don't want you to come to Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yep, she was like, I'm coming to your like house. Too. Right. I'm like, oh, you could have. like, it was bad. But she was like, I'm coming to your house. What you need? I'm like, please don't come to my house. But two of my other girlfriends, they were like, we're getting you out of the house. Like, they literally talked to me that day before. And the next day, they were like, no, we're getting you out of the house. You got to go somewhere. You got to, we're, we're taking you up out of the situation. We're moving you literally. And I was like, I don't want to go. <laughs> that's so real is it it is the, the fact that it was a different phase of the journey that the season had changed or what do you know what was underlying that I think it was a combination of everything mm -hmm. I think it was a combination of 
I'm realizing the reality of him being back home. I am, he's got his, it was all those emotions. It was all that responsibility. It was everything. You you don't have a job. Where, what are you about to do now? Who are you going to care for? You're no longer, and I'm going to tell you, even my body went through a metamorphosis. And I, how I, why do I say that is because my muscles from, from my neck all the way down to my legs, they were tight. I thought that it was muscle. It was not much muscle. It was tension. My God. Because after that, it was almost like everything released. So it was depression. Like depression will have your body. Depression and anxiety will have you tight. And you don't know what it is. Like it literally gripped me. And and keep in mind, like you said, we don't like to talk about depression. Mm -hmm. Believers, we don't like to talk about it because we don't like to admit that it happens to us. It happens to us more so than not. And the reason being is because whenever we're leaders in ministry, it happens because we take on so many things from other people. Mm -hmm. And what we have to do, we have to have an outlet. We have to either write about it. We have to talk about it. We have to have tools so that we can deal with it because depression happens. There are things even in the body of Christ. Let me tell you something. Elijah was depressed. Yes. Whenever yes, Jezebel said she was coming after him. Listen, so you can't tell me. Suicidal. Right. You can't tell me that depression isn't real. Not only is it real, but we need to be able to not only deal with it, but we need to be able to recognize it for what it is so that we can not only deal with it we can speak to it yeah. and we can come out of it victorious Amen. because what happens is as a caregiver I didn't realize that everything had come down on me to a point and think about it like this he was living mm -hmm. he is living what would have happened if all of that would have been for naught mm. Yeah. Because let's deal with the reality of a caregiver. Every caregiver doesn't have the same end game, end story that we have had. Yeah. There isn't always a victory in life. Yeah. And how do you prepare for that? Mm -hmm. So in dealing with the depression, it was everything. It was all of the taking care of, it was all of the taking care of the household. It was all of the responsibility. It was everything that came along with the transplant, that came along with the responsibility for the house, that came along with how are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? What am I going to do now? What's next? Where am I going? I don't have this to do, but what do I have to do next? And where does that go? That doesn't even talk about the things that I was taking care of or taking on as far as ministry, because let me tell you something. He literally told me, don't you take one more ministerial phone call. Don't mm -hmm. you take one more call where somebody is asking you to pour. Don't you take one more phone call where somebody is asking you for advice or telling you their problem. Don't you take one more. That is why it is so essential for us to sit down and rest. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was everything. It was everything. And we have to be honest. Ministers, evangelists, bishops, prophets, teachers get depressed. Let me be the first. If, if nobody else has told you, let me be the first to tell you. Let me be honest about it. We won't stay in it, mm -hmm. but we have to be honest enough as leaders as speakers, as those who are in the forefront to say it happens, even if we don't stay there, we may have tools to deal with it, but it happens because some people don't even want to come to us to get advice because they feel we haven't dealt with it. Yes, we've dealt with it. And a lot of times we're teetering on the brink of it whenever we're trying to lead a flock, a nation, a people to better, to greater, and to more close relationships with God. Hmm. And it's not that we don't believe, it's because of the weight of what we carry. Yeah. Whether we ask for it or not. So this is 
my public service announcement for <laughs> Jesus and therapy. That's uh, right. <laughs> you know, there there has been so much stigma around talking to someone. It doesn't have to be a counselor. It can be mm -hmm. a coach. It could be a friend. It could be a pastor, whoever it is, but somebody who can hear you and not judge you. Mm -hmm. Make that a part of your circle. Make that a part of mm -hmm. your self-care because That's it's right. so powerful. You also mentioned journaling, you know, sitting mm -hmm. with God, meditating, and mm -hmm. all of those are incredible things. And I know that you have some resources to help people do just that. <laughs> can you tell just a little bit about your books and how people can find those? So I have a website. Let me give you my website. My website is www.tiffanylmyers.com. Um, and that is where you can find my books. I have two books so far. One is Dear Sons, version one and version two. Version one is um, Imperfect and Flawed Moms, Why? And book two is The Rebirth. Mm -hmm. Those were love letters basically to my son based on the trauma that I had gone through whenever I was younger. The trauma that I had gone through whenever I was younger and um, how I overcame that and also letting my sons know that they can not only overcome trauma, but they can also be better and not mm. bitter. So that's that. And then I have the journal. I have a caregiving journal. And I'm gonna show in just a second. I do have a caregiving journal. And the reason I created the caregiving journal is just for the reason that we've been talking about, because sometimes you need an outlet. Yes. And I wanted to have an outlet for caregivers. I wanted to have an outlet for um, people just going through so that in the caregiving journal, I'm going to show it to you in a second. It is right here in my lap. Um, I wanted to create it so that caregivers can actually, here it is. And you see it's it. a little blurry, but we can put up a picture as well. There, there you go. It's a caregiver show. Mm -hmm. So the reason I created it was because it has prayers in it. It has um, the very first page after you get beyond the prayers. It tells you to sit and to breathe before you even write. Because a lot of times we don't sit and we don't breathe. Mm -hmm. we, we might do one, but we're not going to do both. Yeah. Not in an intentional way. It has a brain dump section. It has a budget section. Um, it has just a journaling section. It has a section where you can take stickers out and you can use the st stickers. It has coloring pages. And the reason I, I created all of that is because caregivers need so many different things. Yes. And who said that they couldn't all be in one journal? Come on. Because sometimes you just need to get things out of your head. Mm -hmm. That was one of the reasons I was probably depressed because it was so much in my head. Sometimes you just need to get so, some things out of your head that's not serving you or that you just need to think, think of later. A budget section. We needed a budget section because we were taking care of a house here. And then we had to be in Charleston where we had to pay bills. We had to travel. We had to do all these things. We had to eat. All kinds of stuff. So it was necessary. So I kept that in mind with, what does the caregiver need? How is it going to serve them? What can I do to create something that they can use? And it has served, I even gave it to a nurse that was caring for my husband. She got one. She said, I'm probably going to get way more than this. Because <laughs> she said it was, it allowed her the ability to condense her thoughts into one place because she always felt like she was all over the place, but it allows her to do one thing at a time and it makes sense. I was like, wow. And a lot of times someone else got in and she was like, I just feel God whenever I, I, I pick it up. She said, because she said, I don't know what you did. I was like, listen, I said, I just heard God and God was like, create a journal. Wow. Amazing. So, so that's at tiffanylmyers.com and that's M-Y-E-R-S. Yes. <laughs> awesome. And there is a caregiving book coming. 
okay, we'll keep an eye out for that. You'll have to come yes. back and tell us all about that. When it I will. Up. Wonderful. Uh, just before we go, what Bible verse encourages you? Ooh. Mm. Let's see. So I want to look in here because I don't have one favorite verse. Mm -hmm. I have several. Um, one of the verses that I wrote, oh, and you're going to ask me and I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> but I can read it. I can read it. I can read it. Okay. okay. So I will say Romans 15, 13. Mm. And Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all the joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Yes. And the reason I wrote that is because that's right up under one of the care under the caregiving truths that I premised my um, caregiving journal off of. And it is because a lot of times as a caregiver, you need strength. You definitely need peace because a lot of people may be going through the journal journey and they don't find peace yeah and then you sometimes just need a little bit of hope amen there were so many times that i may have sat on the edge of the bed and i was just like okay god i just need to be able to make it to charleston i don't know how i'm gonna make it i'm tired i don't know how i'm gonna get there i don't know how i'm gonna do this but god i just need you to be there i just need you to be my strength okay god and that was my hope i'm hoping that we're gonna get to charleston yeah so in that hope and that was why i put that one prayer but there are other scriptures and there are other prayers in here and there are so many different ones that i just relied on yeah and it was just sometimes just hearing the voice of god just god i know you got me and he does he does such an encouraging verse, Romans 15, 13. Tiffany, thank you so much for spending some time and just sharing your journey and uh, all the powerful insights that you gave us. Take five, right? Be intentional, breathe, sit down, you know, all of those things. And, and of course, communicate, build a support yes. network. All those things are so powerful. And, and uh, maybe the biggest is do not try to pour from an empty vessel. Uh -uh. We need to keep that in mind and that's for people giving care people receiving care that's for everybody mm -hmm. it right? is. to make sure that you are taking time to take care of yourself so that you can be at your best when you're caring for others yes thank you for sharing your wisdom thank you for what you're doing in the kingdom and just we just pray god's blessings upon you and i would like to ask you to close us out with a word of prayer for all of those who are in either side of that caregiving relationship okay not a problem and thank you for having me as well. I appreciate you. Thank it's you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now. We say thank you, God, for this opportunity. I say thank you for Allison. I thank you for her, the platform. I even thank you for her heart, God, because she has a heart and a servant's heart for you. I just thank you for Allison so much, God. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you just pour back in and you bless her. God, right now, I even pray for the caregivers. I pray for their loved ones that they're caring for. God, right now, I ask you that you go to each person who hears this, each person who is connected to someone who is listening, God, and they just take on a new attitude, God. They they are the support system for the caregiver. They're the support system for the one who is being cared for. God, right now, in the name of Jesus, I even ask that the person who is the caregiver, that they begin to take intentional minutes so that not only they can spend time with you, so that they can also see and know that their loved one that they are caring for is not in this situation because they want to be, but they're in this situation just because of the circumstance, God, and they don't take anything out on them. God, right now, even the loved one, I ask that they see their caregiver in a new light, God, that they begin to see and share in, with their caregiver and say, take a break. I love you. God, right now, I ask that the words that they have between one another are yes and amen, and they have a new attitude and a new outlook, even whenever the situation seems that it is dire, whenever the situation seems they can't take anymore, God, I ask that you be the strength in the middle of it. I ask that you be the love, the peace, and the joy in the middle of it, God, that surpasses all understanding. God, right now, 
I even ask that whenever there seems that there is no hope, that there is no answer, there are no funds, that there is no support. God, right now, I even ask that you send a ram in the bush. I ask that even if it's a stranger, that you send that person that they need in the moment. I ask that you send them a reminder that you are not only with them, you are going to endure with them into the end. God, right now, even I ask that for the person that feels like I don't have anybody that I can call on, that the phone begins to ring. The phone begins to ring off the hook so that they have that support, so that they have those people around them, that you give them the answer. They have a divine answer. They have a divine connection, and they get not only what they need, what they have been looking for, God, what they have been praying for, even the things that they pray for that they have not said, God. I ask that you just begin to give them reminders and send the people that they need, even the person that is needing care, God. I even ask that you just be the lamp for them, that you just be the light to them, that you just be the strength for them, that you just be what it is that they need in this moment, God. Whether they're in their home, whether they're in a nursing home, whether they're in the hospital, God, it doesn't matter where they are, God. I ask that you be the answered prayer. I ask that you, for the petition that is laid on their heart, God, I ask that you just begin to do a new thing, that you just send a reminder. God, even if it is another caregiver consultant, a caregiver coach, I even ask that if they're in the hospital, that they meet that person, God, and you meet them at their need in their need, in the time that they need it, God. I ask for perfect timing in the name of Jesus, God, right now. And for those who are looking on a loved one who is going to go to the grave, who is going to say and answer that call, God, I ask that there be a peace that surpasses all understanding because even unto death, there is still victory, God. We're going to deal in reality. And we know that sometimes the person has to go and they have to answer that call because we all do. I ask that you just give them a strength and a peace and a joy that their loved one's life was fulfilled, God. And for the caregiver, God, I ask that you just give them a hug and just let them know, son, daughter, job well done. God, we love you, we adore you, and we bless you. We say hallelujah, God, because we know that you are meeting the needs. We know that you are meeting the heart's petition. You know man and woman's heart, God, and we know that you are going to do the thing that we have been asking for, God. In the name of Jesus, even for the person that feels like they can't endure anymore, give them a little bit more strength and just remind them, I am with you. I will never leave, nor will I forsake you. I am here always. And we say we love you and we bless you and we thank you, God. And we say amen. Amen and amen. Thank you so, so much for covering our caregivers and for those receiving care. And thank you so much for your prayers for me. I appreciate you. I love you. And I'm so glad that you spent some time with us today. So thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who joined us today. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Living Crown of Faith podcast. Hey, thanks so much for listening. If you want to stay up to date on what's happening in the LCF community or for more faith first chronic diagnosis content, please visit our website at livingchronicfaith.com. And while you're there, consider registering for membership free of charge. Also, check us out on Instagram and YouTube at Living Chronic Faith. Be sure to follow and subscribe. Remember that I'm praying for you. Yes, you. And until next time, always expect great things. Talk to you soon.